They called her the mischievous one. Obviously full of love. And she became a mother to two nations. She was already royal um, before anybody ever called her a princess. Her journey of faith. She probably knew the Christian faith better than many British. That took her across an ocean. It was truly a love relationship between the two of them. Our series on Pocahontas continues on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show and happy Thanksgiving week. And we're happy to announce that many retailers are now keeping their doors closed on Thanksgiving Day. The Mall of America, which has been open on Thanksgiving Day for the past four years, has taken the lead in this new initiative, vowing to close its doors until the feasting is over. I'm not sure when that is, but uh, <laughs> the mall says Thanksgiving is about family, not about blowing cash. you got to love that. To boost employee morale and preserve the power of Black Friday shopping, other stores like, stores like Costco, Nordstrom, Marshalls, TJ Maxx, Home Depot, Lowe's, and Ikea are following suit. And good for <laughs> them. Are you shocked? Uh, I I, I, actually, I am, because I, I, I am thought too. America had c become this... 24 hour always open shopping experience and uh, I, just in my own life coming to realize that uh, taking a Sabbath Amen. and mm. just saying I'm not going to transact business. I'm not yes. going to use it as a, yes. well, now I get to get caught up on my grocery shopping or whatever shopping yes. and, yeah. and just say, let's honor the Lord. And wouldn't it be great as a culture uh, for everybody involved in retail, especially yes. to say, okay, uh, let's honor God. I know some very successful businesses that have done it, uh, and it's not just Chick Fil A. Yeah, um, and it's it's great. I think yeah. it, I, I, I hope think it catches on. I think it's wonderful. On. I really do. I think it. You know, whether whether you do it for biblical reasons or to have quality time with your family or even just to take that exhale day, I think it's it's significant. It really well, makes Well, the a biblical reasons are for you. Absolutely. Uh, Jesus yeah. said the Sabbath was made for man. Mm -hmm. It means we need a rest. Yeah, we sure do. I do. <laughs> Ever wonder what ex-presidents do to stay busy? Well, it seems that George W. Bush spends a great deal of time painting portraits. Recently, the former president shared this picture on his Instagram page with this caption, over the past several months, I've painted portraits of 98 wounded warriors. I've gotten to know remarkable men and women who were injured carrying out my orders. Wow, he also announced that next spring these portraits are going to be featured in the book Portraits of Courage and at a special exhibit at the George W. Bush Presidential Center in Dallas. I love that. Who knew? It's one, uh, uh, you, he's de definitely taking ownership. Yeah. Uh, you, you um, burden of responsibility, the decision to go to yeah. war, um, the aftermath of 9 11, what do you do? Mm -hmm. how, do how do you respond to it? Uh, that's very. Yeah. That's taking ownership in a very personal. It way. really is, and I. I just. I mean, he. He's good. Yeah. I, I enjoy. Who knew? The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shocking. <laughs> but wonderfully shocking. Yeah. No, I think it's really a great way to honor these men and women. And we do need so to much. honor our vets, mm -hmm. and there are lots of different ways you can do it. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind, this is the longest war uh, that our country has ever been involved in, and. You look at it and go, is there ever going to be an end? Yeah. Is there ever going to be an end to terrorism? Is there ever going to be an end to ISIS? Uh, ongoing strife in the Middle East, uh, the destruction in Aleppo, all of these things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we need to honor those who have volunteered to put themselves in harm's way. Very well, here's another honor, and it's going to Terry Musin, <laughs> and she's doing something new on Facebook, and it's called Tuesdays with Terry. Take a look. Hi, happy Tuesday. I just came back from visiting my mom who's in memory care up in Michigan and 88 years old and doesn't always know what's happening in the world around her doesn't always remember what's happened in the past but you know she's left such a legacy to me and to my siblings of wonderful times together as family wonderful times together just quietly with her things that she impressed upon us as we were growing up and I'm so thankful for that 
And it reminded me of the importance of family, the significance of belonging, of having a place that you come from, someone who nurtured and invested themselves in you. And it's important, it's so important. So today I wanna to honor my mom, but I also wanna to say to all of you who are parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, invest in your kids. It makes a huge difference in how they see themselves, in what they contribute to the world. You're investing in tomorrow for millions and millions of people when you do that. So the power of belonging, you can make a difference today. And that's a pretty wonderful message. And if you'd like to visit with Terry, there's a very easy way to do it. All you have to do is follow Orphan's Promise on Facebook. And every Tuesday, you can spend a wonderful Tuesday with Terry. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's fun for me to be able to do that with you as well. Well, in that segment, I talked about investing in your kids. But what if the law denied you that right? That's what's actually happening to a Minnesota mom. Her teenage son is undergoing a sex change, and there's nothing she can do about it. Anne-Marie Calgaro told reporters last week that she is suing St. Louis County, two health care providers, and the St. Louis County School District. Her attorney said Calgaro is suing because her 17-year-old son is being changed from a boy to a girl without her consent and without a court order. Well, according to Calgaro, the state's medical assistance funds are paying for her son's apartment, medicines, including powerful narcotics that will help with this sex change. Here's her plea for justice. I believe that my constitutional civil right to have my case heard in a court of law has been stripped from me. If this had been a child custody case, I would have had my day in court. If my son were to be placed in foster care, I would have had my day in court. Or if he had been referred to child protection, I would have had my day in court. I am firmly committed to what is best for my son. I am his mother, and he has always been and always will be welcome in our home. That is an amazing story, and you wonder how do parental rights yeah. get stripped away, and, and specifically uh, consent for any kind of surgical procedure. Uh, and I, I don't understand this one. How, how, how does a medical provider uh, void parental rights in this kind of life-changing uh, surgery? This is a, this is a big story. Mm -hmm. What do you think the... the future looks like with something like this if it's allowed to happen? Well, I think increasingly we're going to see a reduction in parental rights, wow. and I don't think this is anything new. Um, when, when you give your children into a public school system, then they are going to be educated in that system. And in whatever you, way the system may not chooses. Like what, yeah. they're, what they're going to be learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's gone a lot farther than just reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, they're now teaching uh, new social norms, and yeah. this, is, this is part of it. Wow. Uh, so I see this increasingly happening, and, and oddly happening in the name of human rights, uh, that somehow or other uh, just waving the transgender flag uh, gets you into yeah. some kind of different protected class, even though as a minor in any other surgical procedure, you would be deemed not being able to give informed consent that only your parents can give that kind of informed wow. consent because only they appreciate the risk. The implications of that are unbelievable. I mean. And, um, you know, you, you look at life post-surgery mm. and you know, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to solve the problems that yeah. you think it's going to solve. Yeah. Sometimes when you're 17 also, you know, life changes down the road. He can so. be a little impulsive. Mm -hmm. At least that was my story. Okay. Well, here's something to cheer you up. In only one week, this video has been seen 55 million times. <laughs> it's just an Alabama grandma trying to put her grandbaby to bed. And at five feet tall, let's just say that grandma faced some added challenges. You know, they don't make sides of, of cribs to go up and down anymore. So <laughs> when you're five feet tall, you kind of need the little stool there for help. But can't, whoa, whoa, nope. 
<laughs> so if I were grandma, I'd just kind of lay down there and take a nap with the baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I think you just woke the baby up. Yeah, watch this. Watch this. You'll see. You know, she's like, how do I get myself out of here? <laughs> Which so you've seen this. This is yeah, brand new to yeah. me. This is... Isn't much easier getting out than it was getting in, but there you go. And oh, but I'm bum. Oh, okay. <laughs> now wide awake, and now what do you do? <laughs> no, nap time's over. <laughs> nap I had a grandmother over. who was five two, and she definitely had things that would go up. And yep. Down, but, you yeah. Know, it was, and she always needed help from grandpa uh, whenever she needed something off a shelf. So. Yeah. Well, and then the, the cribs where they went up and down, you know, the baby just be asleep, and you'd have to kind of click it a little bit to make it stay up. So the crib's an improvement, perhaps not the methodology here, but anyway. 55 million times, that's a lot of views. Coming up, Pocahontas meets the man who would radically change her life, and he's not Captain John Smith. Once you know the truth, within you, you must share it. I will share with my people. That does my heart good to hear. See how their friendship brought two worlds together after this. Well, most of us are familiar with the legend of Pocahontas, but what's the real truth behind the myth? In part two of our Pocahontas docudrama, you're going to meet the man who captivated Powhatan's favorite daughter, and he's not Captain John Smith. Pocahontas, whose given name was Matoaka, was no stranger to the colonists. As a little girl, she brought gifts of food to Jamestown. She also played games with the English boys. Living up to her nickname, Pocahontas, which means naughty or mischievous one. Pocahontas seemed to have been beloved by the colonists and by her peoples, the Powhatan as well. I think the Englishmen saw this innocent child. You know, this wasn't someone who was going to attack you or anything like that. And I think similarly to the Powhatan, this was obviously an example of the innocence and goodness of their people and a symbol of her father's sort of benevolent power. I think her personality was light. I think she was obviously full of love and generosity and grace. So she was already royal um, before anybody ever called her a princess. When Chief Powhatan heard that his favorite daughter had been captured, he released the prisoners but told the settlers that all the guns were broken or lost. Sir Thomas Dale, the governor of the Virginia colony, didn't believe Powhatan's story, and he refused to release Pocahontas. In the spring of 1613, Dale sent Pocahontas to the neighboring settlement of Enricus, under the care of his trusted friend, the Reverend Alexander Whitaker. I was reading from Matthew. Whitaker spent the next year teaching Pocahontas about the Bible. Just one of my favorites. It is called the Sermon on the Mount. When Alexander Whitaker arrived, he would have had the Book of Common Prayer with this revised catechism. He would have had a Bible, probably the Geneva Bible. So this is what Alexander Whitaker would have taught Pocahontas and she, in question and answer form, would have learned all the basic doctrines about who is God, who is Jesus Christ, what it means to be a Christian. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's not conversion at the point of an ax or a spear or a sword. This is a logical conversion. You know, it's, this is what we believe, this is why we believe it. Paul talks about the unknown God. He finds the altar and he says, this is the altar to the unknown God. He says, I'm going to tell you about that fella. This, this is what I see Whitaker doing. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Yes? You understand? Mercy. Mercy. From Correct. God. From God, yes. 
Yes. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, not the warriors, not the soldiers, the peacemakers. My brothers are warriors. Are they not children of God? We are all children of God. But we should come to seek to be understood and to understand rather than to take and force. Yes? It is the peacemakers. I think that Alexander Whitaker became like a father to her as he was teaching her about things that she didn't know in her mind, but in her spirit she knew already. And I think he just brought it into focus for her and helped her to understand it. And so once she did understand it, then her relationship with the Lord became more intimate. The irony is she probably knew the Christian faith better than many British people who had not really been very well instructed in the faith in which they'd been baptized as, as babies, you know, and grown up in a state church situation uh, where the Christian faith was often very nominal. There were tribes that believed in God. The Creator is what they called Him, or a great giver of life. Um, they did not know Jesus, and she wanted to bring that liberty and that freedom to her people. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Yes? Henricus. <laughs> yes. And once you know the truth, within you, you must share it. You cannot hide, and you cannot turn away, for the Lord will see. I will share with my people. That does my heart good to hear. While Pocahontas was in the care of Reverend Whitaker, she caught the eye of another resident of Henricus, a young entrepreneur and widower named John Rolfe. was able to produce a pan of tobacco that became the saving of the colony, Virginia Tobacco. So he was an important person commercially for the colony. <laughs> she was native to the area. She would have understood uh, the agriculture. Um, and so therefore she would have been Im important uh, to Rolf because of him growing the tobacco, the fact that he'd brought up seed and so therefore it was mixing it with, with the native tobacco plant. And um, so that would have been important. And the, the fact is it's tobacco that saved the colony. You really know your way around the garden? Of course. Mm -hmm. I have to. I think that he may have originally come to her for her knowledge of growing tobacco, but he fell in love with her because she was who she was. And it was truly a love relationship between the two of them. A deeply pious man, Rolf was concerned that his motives in courting a native woman may be misunderstood. He wrestled with his convictions, but in the end, he followed his heart and wrote to the governor requesting permission to marry Pocahontas. To Sir Thomas Dale, Governor, Henricus Settlement. My chief intent and purpose is to strive with all the power of my body and mind for the glory of God and for the conversion to the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, Pocahontas, to whom my hearty and best thoughts are and have a long time been so entangled and enthralled in so intricate a labyrinth that I was weary of finding a way out. But God has opened the gate and led me by the hand that I might plainly see safe paths to tread. As I proceed, my daily prayers shall be to bring to pass such good that all the world may truly say, this is the work of God, and it is marvelous in our eyes. I think it's one of the most remarkable documents in history because how honest he is really with himself and his own motivations. 
he hints at some of the feelings he was having for her and so on, and even the physical attractiveness. And so a lot of soul searching about that. But I think he was sincere and I think God was in that. When I read the letter that he wrote asking for permission to marry Pocahontas, I could feel the integrity of what he was saying, he said, this is not a lustful thing. This is not something that's a political thing or anything. I love her and we want to be married. And I don't want it to be seen as anything other than a sincere desire to be with the woman I love. In March of 1614, before Ralph's letter was delivered, Dale sailed up the Virginia coast to try again to exchange Pocahontas for the pillage guns. When Dale's group arrived, they were met by two of Pocahontas' half-brothers. Although they were happy to see their sister unharmed, they refused to return the guns. Pocahontas responded with news of her own. To hear what news Pocahontas had for her brothers, you'll have to tune in for tomorrow's 700 Club Interactive. That's when we're going to feature the third and final part of our Pocahontas docudrama. You can get your own copy, by the way, of Pocahontas for a gift of $10. To order your DVD, just call the number on your screen. It's toll free, 1-800-700-7000. Or you can go to 700clubinteractive.com and click the Pocahontas tab at the top of the page. Quite an endeavor putting all of this together. Did you learn something you didn't know? Uh, I kind of grew up with this story, uh -huh. and um, you know, in, in college, really studied the College of Henricus, which mm -hmm. was the first college in America it was designed mm -hmm. to evangelize the Indians. So I knew the the real story, mm -hmm. and it's great to have, finally have an opportunity to put to it. Tell it, yes. Yeah, well done. Well done. People are really enjoying that. Well, still ahead, a young mother is paralyzed by pain for three and a half years. All I did was sit on the couch and complain and cry and just sit in pain. My whole body hurt. Watch what happens after her doctor sends her home to die. Well, Barbara Oden loves to drive her children around in their utility vehicle and just for the fun of it. But not long ago, Barbara was confined to her couch in tremendous pain. And after three years with no relief, Barbara was so discouraged that she prayed to die. All I did was sit on the couch and complain and cry and just sit in pain. My whole body hurt. In 2012, Barbara Odin started having intense stomach pains and couldn't keep any food down. Within a week, the pain became so unbearable, she went to the emergency room. Doctors diagnosed her with acid reflux and gave her medication, but it didn't work. So I ended up suffering from terrible migraines where I would lose my balance. Vision would blur, which made my stomach sicker. Barbara's symptoms continued to get worse. Over the next two years, doctors and specialists ran a multitude of tests trying to determine a cause. They checked me for cancer, they checked my thyroid, done three uh, upper endoscopies, um, a colonoscopy, um, and they still could not find anything at all. Unable to eat anything except crackers and water, she lost a third of her size and went down to 107 pounds. My face aged quite a bit and just looked very deathly ill. My bones were poking everywhere. Just, you could see my collarbone poking out. Very crazy, crazy looking. What bothered her most was not being able to care for her children properly. I felt really sad that I didn't really have my mama there. I mean, even, when, but whenever I was sick, while she was sick, she forced herself to get up and make me soup too. It would almost make me cry. Like, I knew that she was suffering, I would still go over there and tell her how much I love her. I love my kids very much. And every day I would wake up, all right, I'm going to fight this. This is, this is going to be the day that I'm going to be better. And just to deal with the same suffering. In March of 2015, Barbara had to quit her job. Then she received a grim prognosis. I had one doctor say that my body was just shutting down. They didn't know why and just go home and die. 
And I thought, well, this is it. I'm 107 pounds. I have literally no energy. I'm, I felt death inside of me. Barbara surrendered everything to God. And I prayed to God to just let me die. I couldn't handle it anymore watching my kids watch me suffer. The next day, Barbara was watching TV when she came across the 700 Club. I had just eaten, I think it was a piece of bread, and I was doubled over in pain on the couch. I knew it was a Christian channel, but I had never watched it before. At the end of that show, it said, Someone else, you have a problem, an esophageal problem, and it has something to do with your digestion. God's healing that condition for you. You'll not have any of those complications again. It was like somebody was saying, hey, wake up. This is for you. You're healed. It was like a burst of energy, which all I could say would be like the Holy Spirit inside of me. Um, I felt happy. I felt, I felt healed. Barbara did something she wasn't able to do in three and a half years. I immediately went and made myself something to eat just to test the waters. <laughs> and I didn't have the stomach pain. My body felt normal, like, I, like as if I had never been sick. Barbara is back to her normal weight and in good health and taking care of her family again. You keep all faith and hope in God because He is the healer. And the doctors can only do so much. And then there's God. God's right there. He's got His hand on you. And you will be healed. Got His hand on you and you will be healed. What a great story and what a great God. The great news also is that we get to pray to Him at any time we want. We get to come to Him and say, Daddy, this is what I need today. If you're in pain, if you're having sickness, if the doctors are saying there's no cure, realize that with Jesus, there's always a cure. All we have to do is pray. So let's do that right now. Lord, we just lift those who are hurting in the audience, those who are suffering, and Lord, we just lift them to your throne of grace and we come boldly with expectation, knowing that you long to heal your children, mm -hmm. knowing that your love reaches and your power reaches and you are able. So Lord, stretch forth your hand to do miracles. We receive them now in Jesus' name. Uh, there's a woman named Tina. You have a pinched nerve and it's causing pain in your right shoulder uh, and real tenseness and knots of uh, muscle and pain. God has just healed all of that for you and released it now in Jesus' name. There's someone else. You've been diagnosed with a form of mold in your lungs. It's like mm -hmm. spores that have attached there. God's healing you completely. Just exhale that and breathe in clean air. You're healed. Amen. If you need prayer, we're always here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone. We're just a phone call away. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word for you from Hebrews. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God bless you. We'll see you again.